Father, we give you thanks for this time. Thank you for uh, the gift of children, and thank you for the gift of uh, teenage children, young adult children in particular. We know that children are a gift from you at every stage, and so we thank you for that particular gift. We thank you for the particular challenges, uh, for the particular uh, even temptations. We pray that you would uh, give us wisdom and strength as we consider these things. Bless our families um, as we seek your wisdom in, in raising our children. And we pray particularly for wisdom as we think about um, the gift of marriage, preparing for marriage, pursuing marriage. Uh, Father, please pour out your spirit upon us so that we might see clearly, that we might uh, seek your word and we might know how to love and teach our children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of, of this talk is Crushes, Romance, and Courtship. Uh, I, Pastor Doug once said, I don't know if it was in a talk or if it was in one of his books, but uh, he, he said, once said that with dating, sort of your, your usual run-of-the-mill casual dating, um, just the way the world pairs off, the way the world hooks up, whatever, uh, with, with that sort of casual worldly dating, you frequently have two idiots involved, two idiots involved, the guy and the girl, which can get pretty bad then. But the thing about courtship that you need to know is that you always have the possibility of having as many as six idiots involved. Right? So now you not only have the guy and the girl, but you've got mom and dad and mom and dad. And, you know, what could go wrong with six idiots? You know, it's, the point is, is that it's um, absolutely possible to make a train wreck of something that has a sort of more Bible-sounding or conservative Christian-sounding name, courtship. Oh, does not sound traditional. Doesn't that sound conservative? Doesn't that sound like something out of Little House on the Prairie? Or you know, doesn't that sound 1950s? Whatever. Uh, but just just simply because you say you believe in courtship, or because you read uh, one of Pastor Doug's books, does absolutely nothing to ensure that anyone will behave themselves or be wise about anything. <laughs> it's not enough to say a special word and wave your hands over it. Uh, we have to be obedient to God's word first and foremost, and then wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We still have to obey God's word, and then we have to be wise. We have to have wisdom as we apply God's word uh, to our lives. The foundation for all our thinking about romance and marriage has got to be Christ and the church. It's got to be the gospel. Of course, we say it's, it's the word of God, it's scripture, of course, it's Christ himself. Um, but in particular, as we look at scripture, the foundation for all our thinking about romance and marriage um, has to be Christ and the church. Paul says that when he thinks about how God made Adam and Eve and established the pattern of a man leaving his parents to join his wife and the two becoming one flesh, he immediately thinks of Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Um, and so so should we. That, that's the point. As you think about your daughter marrying some man one day, or you think about your son pursuing a woman honorably uh, to marry her, um, you ought to immediately flip back to Christ in the church. Paul does that when he's giving instructions to husbands and wives. This is what you do, husbands. You love your wife. It's Christ of the church. Wives, you submit to your um, husband as the church does to Christ in all things. But as you think about these things, immediately think of Christ in the church and make it the sort of thing where um, let it be a touchstone for you. If you're, and as we go through, I'm going to push this into some corners, but I'm not going to be able to push it into all the corners. And, and, and so, but let it be sort of a check for you. Obviously, God's word gives us particular things and we're going to hit those things. Do this, don't do that. But there's a whole host of things that the Bible doesn't, you, you know, you can't do, a, you know, a, a, a word search for, you know, um, texting. And, find, you know, how, how many texts should my daughter send to that young man? How, you know, um, how, you, there, it's not there. And so you need to use wisdom. Um, and, and one of the ways that you, you um, develop wisdom and exercise wisdom in these things is go back to Christ in the church. That's the pattern um, in all of this. Um, if marriage is always talking about the gospel in this way, we've, we've said this uh, in, in this community for, for many years, um, Ephesians 5 teaches this. Marriage is always talking about the gospel. You do not have the option of not talking about the gospel. Husband is always talking about Christ, whether he thinks he is or not. He's saying Christ is like this. 
And either it's a, he's telling the truth and it's a good representation of Christ, our Savior. He's loving his wife as Christ loved the church and giving himself for her and leading her towards holiness and cleansing her with the water of the word or else he's not. And a wife is always talking about the glory of the church. And she's either saying, this is glorious, this is wonderful, this is beautiful, the way I've been loved and respecting her husband and returning his love in obedience and honor, or else she's not. She's lying. She's saying the church is a trashy place. The church is a horrible place to be in, with her complaining or fussing or what have you. But if marriage is always talking about the gospel in this way, then it follows that preparing for marriage does the same. We want all of our preparing for marriage to talk about the gospel truthfully, honestly. We want it to reflect well on Christ and the church. So we're either in our in our leading up to marriage and our preparing for marriage, we're either practicing to live out the gospel well or not. And you can't practice anti-gospel drills in elementary school and junior high and high school and then expect to know how to run the gospel play when you're actually courting, engaged, married. So some of the basic courtship principles we can glean from this pattern of Christ and the church would include at least these three things that, that I'm, I'll point out right now. There's always more. Remember, Christ has always only had one bride. Christ has only ever had one bride. Christ um, has, has, was never... Uh, never interested in anyone else. Now, you say, well, that was easy. <laughs> he was sovereign, and he knew us from before the foundation of the world, and we don't have access to God's decrees concerning the spouses of our children, which, though, that would be nice. Right? God, just give me their name, and, you know, we'll just we'll wait, and then we know. Give me his name, and then we'll, we'll be good to go. You say, well, you know, Christ knew his bride from before the foundation of the world. Easy for him. Right, so make the distinction, we're not God, we're not Christ, we don't know the future, but we can conduct ourselves in such a way toward the goal of having loyalty and faithfulness to one spouse for life. We can conduct ourselves in such a way toward that goal that we can honestly say we only ever had one love. We want that to be our goal. And that means then, so what does dating and courtship look like? What is, um, what is preparing for that look like? It, it needs to look in such a way that it doesn't contradict that goal. Now, yes, is there, is there a process of getting to know someone, finding out, is this a good idea, getting to know her parents, getting to know his parents, figuring, is this, is this, yeah, of course, you're gonna have to do that. And sometimes you're gonna do that multiple times. But what we want to do is we want to do that in such a way that you would never have to go back and say, well, I had this, you know, gave my heart away there, gave my heart away there, gave my heart away there, and then found you, thank God. Right? But that's frequently what's being practiced. Our goal should be to imitate Christ and have one love for our spouse. Another principle we can draw from the pattern of Christ in the church would simply be that of reverent joy for the whole enterprise a deeply reverent joy for the whole enterprise. The gospel, of course, is not bad news. The gospel is good news. But it's the kind of good news that makes you shut your mouth. Right? That's the, the gospel. It's good news, but it's the kind of good news that makes you shut up. Oh, wow. Right? He did what? I'm all forgiven. It's deeply good. It's deeply joyful, but there's also some, there's really deep reverence that surrounds it. We can say something similar about sex and marriage. Hebrews 13.4 says that the marriage bed is to be held in honor among all. The marriage bed is to be held in honor among all. So that means it's to be honored by eight-year-olds. It's to be honored by 12-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 45-year-olds and everyone else. It's to be honored by all. Deep reverence for the marriage bed. High, high glory. And if we combine this with a place like, uh, there's number, numerous places, but the Song of Songs, which is another great place to go, our children should be growing up in a home where they know that their parents love one another exuberantly and are sexually attracted to one another, and it's a high glory. They, they, you know, dad likes kissing mom. I know, it's kind of embarrassing and it's glorious. It's high glory. 
uh, reverent joy. So high reverence, and and it's a really good thing. There's something really that's the gospel, and we want then that to radiate from thinking you know, your own marriage. So your children are growing up, in that, and that's how they think about it. It's a really good thing. It's a really glorious thing, and it's also really special. Don't want to mess that up. It's a high glory. A third principle we can draw from thinking about Christ and the church is just the nature of love and grace itself. Christ died for the unlovely. Christ died for the unlovely. He died for his enemies in order to make us lovely, in order to make us his friends. This applies in countless ways, but I want to apply it to parenting teens in two particular ways. Your love for your children needs to be this kind of gospel love. And, and frequently people, um, will, when you start talking about parenting and, and so on, they, they frequently fall into, they, they, I don't know where we got these particular words, but conditional, unconditional love categories. And I'm, I really don't think those categories are actually that helpful because they don't quite map onto, there might be helpful places in certain ways, but they don't quite map onto um, what godly Christian gospel love really is. Uh, let, let me explain what I, what I mean. Um, God's, God doesn't love us like a transaction, and that's what people mean when they, mean, when they say something like it's un- unconditional love. And so there's, a, there's truth to that. Um, But God's love is efficacious. God's love comes at us and it changes us. It's it's not, he doesn't love us and then send us the bill. Okay, now I loved you a hundred, now you love me a hundred. That's what you owe me. You know, completely conditional love, right? I do this, then you do that. No, it's not like that. But God doesn't just throw his love into the air and say, you know, whatever, Now, there's some of God's love that is just sort of this overabundance, uh, you know, just uh, common grace, the sun shining every day for everyone, lungs for everybody, fingers, you know, just, you know, there is exuberant, over-the-top grace and love, but it's aimed at a result. His love does mean to change us. It's efficacious. His love does efficaciously create in us a deep love in return. So it's, it's, I think it's a little unhelpful to say just completely unconditional. No, it's, yeah, it's not conditional, but it's not really unconditional either. It's something entirely different. It's efficacious. It affects something in us. And parents have to learn to imitate that kind of love toward their children. We do not love them expecting something in return. Jesus says, don't love that way. You know, the pagans love like that. So you don't love your kids and send them a bill for it. You know, I've been making you breakfast for 15 years. This is what you owe me. Okay, that's not gospel love. That's not Christian love. But parents don't love their kids expecting nothing. That's also not gospel love. Because God doesn't love us like that. He loves us. He loves us ex, um, with um, with efficacy, efficaciously, um, and so we do really love our children, expecting godly fruit. Remember, in Second Corinthians, um, Paul is defending his apostolic ministry, and and, the, and if you're reading between the lines, Second Corinthians is just this really crazy, high wire ninja act of apostolic ministry. Um, you read between the lines, and apparently Paul has been accused of being a, a false apostle who basically um, just shows up to ask people for money. And just kind of read between the lines what he's defending is, I really am an apostle, I don't need special papers, all this kind of stuff, and I'm not in it for the greed, I'm not peddling the gospel for, for, you know, for money or anything like that. And then at the end of the letter says, um, you know, none of that's true at all, but you did promise an offering. I mean, no pastor I know is really will, willing to write 2 Corinthians. Right? But, he's, but he says, the point isn't that I need your money. The point is that I want your heart. And I will know that I've gotten through to you if you give that gift that you promised me. Parents have to love their kids kind of like that. I don't need 
this. I'm not demanding this because I need it. It's not about me, but I want your heart and I want the fruitfulness. I want the obedience. I want the blessing for you. So I am going to love you like that. It's, it's efficacious love. And I want to underline something connected to this that Doug said in the Q&A yesterday. Um, this is how you're putting your money in the bank. He was talking about last night where there are going to be times when you have to ask something of your kids that you know that is hard. And when you do that, you're writing a check. And it does absolutely no good to say, well, I'm the dad. And so, it, you know, here I have the, the check. It's got my name on it. Here we go. It's, it has absolutely, it does you absolutely no good to do that if there's no money in the account. In order for the check to clear and not bounce, you have to have that amount of money in the account. And that's what you're doing when you're loving them. When you're, when you're loving them in Christ, when you're pouring on the love, you're gonna, you may need to write some big checks in high school and in college, so be saving up now. I mean that in every sense, right? You know, m- many parents are like, oh, college is coming, <laughs> And they're starting to, you know, tuck something away. And you're like, I'm never going to make it. And I don't know what I'm going to do. Right? But you're, you're just quickly just throwing it, you know, stuffing it in the bank account, putting it under your pillow, whatever. It's because you know the bills are coming. And then they're going to want to get married. Right? <laughs> more, more. It's not enough. Right? You should do the same thing, though, in terms of decision making. They're going to be making some big decisions. I'm going to say some things that might you know, may be challenging at various points. No, he's not the one, honey. No, I, I, don't, I don't think you should take that job. I don't think you should go to that college. I think it's this one. And, and it needs to be done respectfully. It, it needs to be done graciously. But there may be some big checks you have to write, and you should be pouring on the love now. You say, what? Well, she's already 13. Start now, right? You know, that's what the investors always say, right? You know, I haven't been saving retirement. I should, you should have started 20 years ago, right? Start now. <laughs> right? Start saving now and pray over it. God, multiply this. <laughs> Make this love worth even more than it really is so that I can write the checks that I need to write. Um, and, and, so, and, and so related to this, um, uh, you, you need to know that, um, you, and you should relate to that would be occasionally asking something of your son or daughter, your teenage son or daughter, for good reason, occasionally practice this now. Occasionally practice writing checks now. Again, don't be arbitrary. Don't be random. Um, But ask something for some good reason that you know will likely be hard for your teenage son or daughter now. Do it in love, but do it and see how things are going. Does the check clear? Or does it not clear? Or does it barely clear? And or on the love. You got to put more money in the account. You got to you got to work on that relationship. You got to be loving them more, but better to practice that a little bit when they're 13 and 14 and 15 and find out okay, I, I need to be I need to be working on this than to ran, you know, pull out where is that checkbook? I don't know. I've never used it before. And she's 19. All right, now I'm, this is what I'm going to do and then now you know, you know, it's there's trouble and there's it's too late. Um, practice asking things of them for good reason. Do it with respect. Do it kindly, um, but occasionally. Not all the time. Don't be, don't be mean. Um, but do it in love and do it and see how things are going. Better to notice that your bank account is running kind of low earlier than later. And the second thing, and the last thing connected to that, pouring on the love, filling the bank account, is be affectionate with your teenagers now. And especially your daughters. Hug them. Compliment them, hold your daughter's hand, punch your son in the arm. That's love, by the way. Um, Tussle with them. Be interested in what they're interested in. Ask them about it. Delight in them. Delight in them. What what, what are you into? What are you doing? Um, Hold them, grab them, um, hold their hand, hug them, compliment them. Make sure they know you're well pleased with them. Tell them. Tell them how, how proud you are of them regularly. That's food. Um, and I would say do this especially at times or maybe in areas that you're tempted not to. Right? Maybe it's during an especially awkward stage of puberty. They're kind of pudgy. They're, they've got acne. They're, right? right? And it's... 
Well, love them. Pour it on. They know it feels awkward. They feel it. They don't need you telling them, probably, unless he's a really thick boy. You know, have you noticed your acne? They, they see it every morning, right? It's, it's, hold them. Just don't say anything. Just hold them. Hey, man, I love you. I'm so proud of you, right? Hey, honey, that dress is beautiful. You're beautiful in that dress. I'm so proud of you. I love you. That's food. You're feeding them. You're putting money in the bank. And, and, you know, and what are you doing there? You're loving them like Christ loved the church, right? Did Christ come to love you because you, were, you had it so together? No. You were overweight. You were covered in acne. And you were awkward. And you were in rebellion. And Christ came and loved you. And his love has been so efficacious and it has made you more lovely. So love your teenagers like that. Be their friend. Love them. Make sure they know that. Make sure. Be over the top. You know, D- Doug said last night, you know, don't be too weird about it. And I, I agree with him. Don't be too weird about it. But I would say, better to be kind of weird. <laughs> and them know. Okay, Dad, I got it. I got it. Okay, I know you love me. I know. Better that than the other way. And then being like, well, I was just never quite sure if dad really loved me. Right? But be weird. <laughs> be the awkward one in the lunch hall. Honey, you're beautiful. Right? And she turns kind of pink or whatever. You know, I mean, don't actually embarrass her. But, you know, if you, if you know she would, it would really would feed her, encourage her. You know, love them. Love them. Christ in the church. Okay, the first thing to underline, I'm going to rush through this next part because I'm trying to get through all of this, but some of this Doug actually mentioned last night. The first thing to underline is that it's never too early to have the talk. Now, I don't mean zeroed in on the birds and the bees and all the sexual plumbing, per se, so much as I mean talking about marriage and sex and having children and building homes in general. Start talking about it when they're little. You know, and if you're reading the Bible straight through, you kind of have to, you know, well, you know, it's just like, you know, it kind of comes up. What's a prostitute, dad? Well, okay. Yeah. You know, and you just, you have to tell them, you tell them in age appropriate ways, but you tell them, don't lie. Right. Well, that's a woman who is um, getting paid to lay with a man who's not her husband. I don't know. That's how I did it. Or maybe there's better ways, but you know. And and um and but just start talking though about these things like normal. You don't want that to be sort of this off, you know, the shell, you know, you don't bring that up. Don't talk about marriage, don't talk about kids, you know, it's just it just every that's just weird. Uh, no, you gotta start talking about it now. Um and you know, the girls usually kind of want to talk about it, though they're a little embarrassed, and the boys pretend they don't want to talk about it, but they actually do. Right? The boys say it's gross, disgusting, yuck. And, you know, it's like half true. Like it kind of is embarrassing, but part of them really does want to, want to talk about it. So talk about it. Again, don't be, you don't have to be um, obscene. You don't have to go into details that they're not ready for. You don't want your, you know, second grader explaining things in second grade to the, you know, to the rest, the rest of the class that their, other, their parents haven't explained to them yet. Um, but little boys and girls need to be taught from the, their earliest memories about the goodness of marriage that a man and a woman they do, they, have, uh, uh, they lay together, and that's where children come from, and that's good and beautiful, and it's to be honored. And there's, you know, there's no embarrassment, it's just the way things are. And, hu- and what husbands and wives do in marriage, um, hus- the husband is the leader, and, and, and that means that it's really important that you pick a good husband because he's going to lead you. And you're going to follow him and that wives follow and respect and submit. So it's really important that you, you, you choose wisely. Um, that children are a great gift in marriage. And, um, and that we, we love children. We honor the gift of children. We love motherhood. We love homemaking. It's glorious. It's beautiful. And that the project of building a household is one to be pursued but not entered into lightly. Again, back to that reverent joy. It's a really, really good thing. But be careful. The stakes are high. Um, we want to be really careful. And of course, 
The central way you teach that is by living it. By, and, and, but living it is going to include talking about it all the time. And, and like Ben was saying in the last talk, talking about, you know, you see, the, you see the stupid Disney princess story or whatever, and you say, you know, is that true? Is that, that's not true. That's a lie. Does she obey her dad? No. What does that movie say? It said if you disobeyed your dad, everything, you know, your dreams would come true and you'd get to marry the prince. That's a lie. It never happens that way. That's not what real, that's not real love. It, that's, that's a great way to have sorrow and destruction and ruin in your life. So you talk about it a lot. You, t- it, you talk about it as it comes up in your Bible reading, on the movies, or with you know, the, the kids on the playground and, or in their class. Of course, um, th- this means, though, that um, elementary crushes and teenage dating and romance should seem as strange to your kids as a, you know, some 12-year-old sending his resume to Google or Amazon applying for a senior management position, right? You're like, well, I've heard of a 12-year-old doing that. You're like, what? okay, right? No, this is what, what are you doing? You're 12. You're not ready for that. Senior management? Or, you know, given the days we live in, a nine-year-old insisting that she is ready to play with uranium, right? Or why can't the four-year-old be allowed to play with the nine-millimeter? Um, I've said this before, but the fact that the Bible sets dire consequences, like the death penalty, as a possible maximum sentence for some crimes against the marriage covenant, really should make us sit up straight and tall. The family really is nuclear. The family really is nuclear. And what we are experiencing in our world is nuclear fallout on a large scale. Why don't you want your neighbor playing with uranium in his basement? <laughs> because it won't just affect him. It'll affect the whole city. You know, we have things like Chernobyl. I know this is a conference on parenting teens, and maybe this will seem like information you needed years ago, but disciplining four- and five-year-olds is not unrelated to teaching them about romance and marriage. Pastor Doug mentioned this last night. A four-year-old boy who's given free reign of his emotions, throwing fits, fussing when hungry, is really bad practice for when the hormones begin raging through his body at 14, right? He's just been, how would he suddenly know how to control that appetite or that emotion when he hasn't had to control any of his other appetites or emotions before now? The same thing, though, goes for little girls. They also need to be taught self-control, particularly when it comes to things like beauty and romance, They need to be taught not to idolize princes or princesses, romance, or their own beauty. Uh, I'm not saying they shouldn't love the idea of marriage or they shouldn't love the idea of having children or making a home, but there's, there's there's temptations on that side as well, not allowing their imaginations to run wild, not allowing their emotions to run wild when it comes to those things. Little boys need to be taught that God made them strong in order to rule themselves well in order to serve and protect others, in order to pursue one woman and be faithful to her and her children all his days. They're made strong so they would rule themselves well in order to use their strength to serve those around them, particularly one woman, and protect her and her children. Little girls need to be taught that God made them beautiful so that they can serve God and their families through bearing children and making lovely homes. Little boys need to be taught about the danger of bad ladies. That's what we called it in my house, the bad lady. The Proverbs bad lady, right? And um, Ben alluded to this earlier, but in Proverbs, the, the father looks out the window and says, son, see that fool over there? He's going to the bad lady. And it's not too early when you have a four year old or a six year old or a nine year old boy walking by and you walk down the street and you see it happening right outside of Moscow High. Son, you see that? Don't ever do that. What's he doing? Does that look like a good girl? You say, well, isn't that being judgy? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you can, you can explain to them as you go along, you know, I don't know her heart, and maybe she's in a bad place. Maybe her dad didn't teach her well. I don't know. But she's immodest, and that boy's hanging with her. You see that? Or you're walking, you know, we don't really have, we don't have video stores anymore. I remember this when River was little walking through a video, you know, going to grab a DVD from, you know, a Blockbuster or something. Remember Blockbuster? Rest in peace. Um, And, you know, and you have all the covers. I mean, now it's on Netflix, right? Or, you know, Amazon Prime or something, and you're clicking through it. Same principle, right? And you see the cover, and it's like, yeah. 
<laughs> right? And, you know, uh, remember my son running around the corner? You know, Dad, I saw the bad lady. I know. There's a bunch of them here, huh, son? Let's get out quick. Um, but they need to have those categories. Read Proverbs. Um, your daughters need to have, know the danger of bad boys. There are bad guys. They should have that category early on. In multiple places in the Song of Songs, it says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. You see this in Song of Songs 8, verse 4, chapter, seven, or chapter 2, verse 7, and chapter 3, verse 5. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Um, do not awaken love before the time. And parents need to be the ones guarding this and teaching this and not sending mixed signals. It might look cute to you for little Johnny to hold little Susie's hand in kindergarten, but that's a recipe for disaster. Because either they hate it, and then they'll hate you, and that's just sending weird things to, for, to carry them for all the rest of their days, or they'll like it. And that's setting them up for weird things for the rest of their days. Don't do it. They're five, they're seven, they're nine. All talk about who likes who. Games and notes about who likes who or who's going to marry who. And crushes like this are not practicing for wisdom. It's practicing for folly. It's practicing for disaster. It's not gospel love. Christ doesn't love the church like that. He loves me, he loves me not. You know, she loves me, she loves, it's, you know, on again, off again. Who do you like this week? Who do you like this month? Here, here's a note. He might like you. That's not gospel love. Those are just little hits of dopamine. Right? It's just a little, it's, all it is is little drug deals. And they're getting little hits of dopamine that are not teaching them wisdom and self-control. It's, it's teaching them this little hits of excitement about something that's not really meaningful. And then you gotta get a bigger hit. You know, the first one's always free. And then you've gotta get more in order to get that hit, in order to get that high. It really isn't um, helpful. And the same thing goes for moms or dads talking about their kids pairing off someday. Oh, wouldn't it be cute if our Susie married your Johnny? It really isn't helpful. It really isn't helpful. Now, you know, if they're, all, if they're courting and they're 22, I mean, okay, that's obviously what they're thinking about. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about, you know, when they're 15 or 13, um, that really isn't helpful. The point is that marriage is a high stakes matter and therefore casual dating around and playing around with it, trifling with it is just foolish. Don't go shopping if you're not ready to buy. And why not? Well, because shopping before you're ready to buy is a great way to stoke and cultivate discontent, envy, frustration, covetousness, and lust. Right? I wish I had that. Wish I had that. Wish I had what she has. Wish I had what he has. Let's just pretend a little bit, even though we can't do anything, even though we can't, this can't go anywhere. Discontent, envy, frustration, covetousness, and lust. And just because we all know somebody that dated in high school and got married and it all worked out doesn't mean it's a good idea. For every good example, there are hundreds of car wrecks, including sexual sin, guilt, shame, regret, pregnancies, abortions, heartache. So put this point together with the previous one. Talk about courtship and marriage a lot. Talk about it. You know, as often as it comes up. I mean, don't be obsessed. Don't be weird. Back to Doug's point. Don't be weird. But, you know, but it should just be a normal part of conversation. It's part of life. And, um, and, and so talk about it regularly. Talk about having kids, talking about, uh, talk, you know, you know uh, building a family regularly, the glory of it. Talk about it joyfully. Talk about it happily with enthusiasm, not with embarrassment, not with prudishness. And talk about how boys are made to pursue a woman honorably, how they're, they need to honor her parents, making sure they have her, her parents' permission and blessing to do so and to win her hand, and how girls are made to grow up to be pursued, to be honored, and to be won by a worthy suitor. Talk about, talk about it with the appropriate gravity and expectations, and ask questions. What if dad doesn't think he's good for you? 
you know, that should be, you know, that should have been something that they, you know, oh, well, then we're, then I'll, I'll do what dad says. I trust dad. What if he's really handsome? I still trust dad, right? I mean, that, you know, but talk through it. Talk about it. What, son, what if I really don't think she's a godly woman? What if I, what if we really don't think, she, well, I would, I would want to trust you, dad. Talk through it. Talk about it years in advance, not five minutes before, right? You know, file all of this under the duty of parents to love their kids by preparing them. Prepare them for it before they even, you know, they, they, nest, they, don't, they feel it. Um, you know, even before they, they feel the, the pull, the tug, they should be thinking these things so that when the pull, the tug comes, they, oh, that's what dad was talking about. That's what mom was talking about. Um, how can you tell that uh, uh, she's a good woman, son? What are some of the things that would, what you would say? Um, how can you tell he's a good man, daughter? How can you tell that he's wor worthy of respect? How can you tell that um, he would be worth um, considering as a potential husband? Now, of course, um, there's going to be differences between good Christian families um, with regard um, to exact expectations about timing or the exact style. We're going to get into some principles in a minute. Um, you know, is your daughter eligible to be courted right out of high school, halfway through college, after college is completed? Help your sons think about timing as well. Um, when they are ready to ask, when are they going to be ready to ask a father's permission to court his daughter? Um, you need to talk through those things. What are the principles involved? Um, and have good reasons, biblical reasons, for your standards um, to do so. Um, and I want to finish with three um, uh, principles of courtship proper. Three principles of courtship proper. What do we mean by courtship? What do we mean by that term? Number one, we basically we mean um, honoring your father and mother and honoring um, the high stakes of marriage. That's, that's it. You don't have to wear a bonnet. You don't have to sit on the front porch in the porch swing together on Sunday afternoon. No, if you want to, you can. Um, but that's all we mean. We mean honor your father and mother, fifth commandment, and honor the marriage bed. Honor the high stakes of marriage. That's what we mean. Don't trifle with it. Don't treat it casually. Have a high, deep reverence for it and honor the authorities that God has put in place. God lays the particular responsibility of the household with the head of the household, the husband, the father. We see this in Ephesians 5. And we see this spelled out in particular in Numbers 30 for fathers and daughters in their home. I encourage dads, this is a good thing for you to go look at later. Numbers 30 talks about vows and promises made by your daughter in your household. You're responsible for those. God holds you responsible um, for them. And therefore, if it, uh, it applies to vows like getting married, um, it certainly applies to preparing or considering a suitor's um, uh, for marriage. While the Bible does teach that the consent of all parties is necessary in marriage, so all parties need to give their consent. This is why the, the man and the woman are both asked vows in a Christian marriage ceremony, and that's good and proper. Um, we, we don't believe in arranged marriages. The Bible strongly discourages arranged marriages. Um, you think of the, the story of Abraham finding um, a, a Rebecca for Isaac, even there, where a lot of the conversation occurs between Rebecca's brothers and father and Abraham's servant, they still come to her and they say, will you go and marry this man? And she agrees. It's important that she is taking responsibility for her choices as well. Nevertheless, uh, the command that children obey their parents does not disappear at some magical age especially when children are still in their parents' house, especially when the results of a decision will affect grandchildren and inheritance and family legacy. A good name and a godly inheritance are to be prized by good men. This means that if a young man wants to honorably pursue a woman as a potential spouse, this is not something that he may do on his own or casually without her father's permission and involvement. This is, this is what we mean. High stakes, honor father and mother. Um, a young man who wants to pursue a woman as a potential spouse must seek and receive her father's blessing. 
The father is responsible before God for protecting his daughter's spiritual and physical purity all the way to the altar. It's your responsibility to do that. Again, we can look back at everything we've already talked about. There's a lot of prep work that goes into this, and if done well, it can be a real joy and a real delight, and you're on the same team with your daughter, and it, and it really shouldn't be an adversarial thing, but there should be a mutual trust, mutual love, and so on, but the father still takes that responsibility seriously. He is responsible for guarding the kind of family his grandchildren will grow up in. What kind of family do you want your grandchildren to grow up in? A man who tells his son, but especially his daughter, good luck. <laughs> you know, I don't do romance. Good luck is not taking his responsibility seriously. So number one, honor father and mother. That goes for the children. That goes for the, the, the one pursuing marriage. And it means that the father is to take that responsibility seriously. Number two, um, I want to ask the question number two, how far is too far? physically, in terms of intimacy. And the reason for asking it this way is, well, some people just want to know, but also because I think it also helps explain, sort of, I think, can help you think through, what should we be doing, you know, during a courtship? What's, what's helpful, what's good, what's wise, and what isn't? It, it's sort of answered by asking this question, how far is too far during a courtship? Again, think of a courtship not as an engagement, not as, an, as even as engagement light. Courtship just means you're asking for permission to get to know this girl and to see if there's potential there. You can do a courtship honorably for, you know, three weeks or whatever and break it off and no feelings hurt, nobody's harmed anyone, no one's done anything wrong if you do it right. Um, no, this, she's not the one for me, he's not the one for me, great. God bless you and there's, there doesn't need to be anything weird or awkward about it. Um, but so... The simple answer to how far is too far is that there should be no more physical or emotional intimacy than would be appropriate with any other brother or sister in Christ. There, should, there really shouldn't be any other physical or emotional intimacy than would be appropriate with any other brother or sister in Christ. In 1 Timothy 5.2, Paul says to Timothy, treat all younger women um, with all honor as sisters. You really want to aim to have just one love just like Christ, right? Christ has one love. You want to aim to have one love. You don't want to have to ask forgiveness from a future spouse for something that happened in another courtship. And while many may call us prudes, is it really a gift to a future spouse to tell him or her how many people you kissed before them? It's not, it's not a gift. <laughs> That's not a gift at all. An engaged couple must remain completely chaste and pure, but it really is different to be engaged than to merely be courting. When you've made an offer, will you marry me? You have the blessing of father, and she says yes, there's a promise there, and there's a plan. And at that point, I think it's entirely appropriate to begin um, becoming more intimate, again, within law of, the law of chastity. But you really, you know, that's the plan. You're getting married now, and that's good and, and great. I said that this question really must be asked also, though, about emotional intimacy as well as physical. Many Christians are fairly squared away about physical purity. Yeah, yeah I'm, we're not going to do that. We'll wait until we're engaged. We know we're getting married. But then they go completely silly on emotional intimacy. But emotional intimacy is not any less precious. Your heart is not any less precious than your body. Right? It belongs to Jesus. Both of those things do. Uh, do you really want to tell your future spouse that you had an emotionally charged relationship with another person where you shared all of your thoughts and all of your feelings about everything? No. Don't give your heart to anyone other than your spouse. And many well-meaning Christians don't realize that emotional intimacy is actually practicing for physical intimacy. Emotional intimacy is practicing for physical intimacy. Undressing your soul really is practicing for undressing. So if you're not pl planning to go all the way, don't practice. Don't do the foreplay, even emotionally. Don't do it. Long phone calls, what do I mean? Long phone calls, long, long letters, blah, 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 blah. you're not engaged, you're just courting, okay? Long, long phone calls, late night chatting, constant texting, long periods alone. Uh, even so-called pious practices like Bible reading and praying together can be really unhelpful. 
Yes, I just said that. The pastor said that praying and reading the Bible can be unhelpful. Yes, I did. And I'm not, I'm not even sorry. My point is not that you should never read the Bible together or pray during courtship. My point is to be careful, be wise. Uh, you know, pe- people will be like, well, we've been, we were reading our Bible and praying together for hours and then we just fell into sin. Right? It's, it's, I mean, it's bizarre and strange, but no, that's, what were you doing? You were becoming very, very emotionally and spiritually intimate. And the way God made the world, there's this thing called gravity. And, and ordinarily, in a marriage, that leads right to bed. And it's glorious. So don't practice, you know, what, don't start what you can't finish. Even emotionally, even spiritually. And recognize the difference also between boys and girls. Many girls are given a pass with lust. Many girls are given a pass with lust because their lust is entirely emotional, frequently. And they're allowed to talk about all their lovey-dovey feelings and no one bats an eye, right? But those same emotions generally hit guys right in their testosterone. This is not to give any kind of pass to young men who must possess their vessels with all purity and holiness, but the point is that some well-meaning Christians are throwing gasoline on the fire. Most of a courtship can be conducted around family and friends with some time spent paired off. But don't drag it out. If you know you're going to get married, then get engaged. Okay, last one. Well, it should go without saying, non-Christians, Mormons, Muslims, or Roman Catholics may not court our Protestant Reformed daughters. And therefore, they may not flirt with them. And we will not allow our children to flirt with them. Um, we Christians only marry in the Lord and therefore must be equally yoked. Again, this must be something that is taught from the earliest ages. Is it a Christian? Is it a Christian man? Is it a Christian woman? If it's not, it's not an option. We're not friendly towards them. And since we live in a community with Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians, it's worth noting that while we are committed to working together and remaining in fellowship over that issue, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to consider when it comes to courtship and marriage. Do you want your grandchildren to be baptized? We say, oh, yes, we do. Well, when do you want them baptized? It matters. It's a practical issue. So don't, don't pretend that it's not an issue at all. It, it matters. Now, again, it's not a reason to not be in fellowship, but there you go. Related to this is the principle that wisdom is found in the company of many counselors. This is why we live in covenant with one another in the church. While the final decision is up to the family, the church is a community where people are revealed. A little bit of due diligence is a great idea. Much of this can be gathered directly from the young man, and you should ask him, but how are his grades, his relationship with his parents? What do his employers or former employers say about him? How many times has he been fired? What does his pastor say about him? Who are his friends? What's his reputation like in the community? And a young man should be taught and encouraged to generally know the same sorts of things about any girl he's thinking about. I want to finish with this. We live in a sexual cesspool of a world. And the lies of the devil combine with real guilt and shame related to all of this. And therefore, we really have to return to where we began, Christ and the church. We are all sinners in this room. No one in this room had the perfect sinless teen years, dating experience, courtship, or engagement, much less marriage. What many Christians are tempted to do is simply throw up their hands in despair and apathy and just say, that's the way the world is, not perfect, just forgiven, and not do anything about it. Of course, the other temptation is to pretend to have extremely high standards and enforce them legalistically and perfectionistically, even though everyone in the room knows that they're actually impossible to meet, so creating a bunch of hypocrites. What we are aiming for in this community is gracious excellence, grace-driven excellence. We believe in the grace of forgiveness, but we also believe in the grace of sanctification, of growing in holiness, of repentance that turns away from sin but also puts on Christ, puts on new obedience graciously. So how has Christ loved you? He came for you. He took your sins and guilt and shame and all your romantic failures, all of your sexual sin, all of your parenting failures, and he died for them all. He died for them all. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are clean. 
You are righteous. You are holy. You are pure. You have virgin souls. And God rejoices over you. He rejoices over you. He's not holding his fingers behind his back saying, but I really know what you did. It's gone. It's gone. He rejoices over you the same way he rejoices over his own son. Is he holding anything back in joy over his son? No. Then he's not holding anything back in joy over you. And therefore, you can teach your children. Right? He's loved you like that. You can love them like that. You say, but I, I wasn't good. I wasn't holy. I messed up. I failed. How can I stand here and tell them you shouldn't do that when I did it? The, re- the answer is Jesus. The answer is you're forgiven. The answer is you're clean. The answer is it's gone. And so you, you don't, don't pretend that you, you, know, that you, you never sinned. You don't lie. But you don't have to sit there falling all over yourself, wallowing in all your sin, dragging your kids down into what you were delivered from, which is what a lot of parents do. It was so horrible. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. You should not do this. Right? And then they're, well, mom did it, and I guess she just survived. I guess it's not so bad. Dad did it. I guess I can, you know, eh, we're all a bunch of lousy sinners. No, don't do it like that. You're forgiven. Yeah, I didn't get all this teaching, kids. I didn't know better, or, or I did know better, and I sinned against it. But you know what? I'm forgiven, and I want better for you. Push them forward in excellence, in grace. Not lying, not hypocrisy, but in grace. By the grace of God, he has better for us, kids. And he has better for your grandkids and your grandkids after you. Father, we commit all this to you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for our teens. Thank you for our younger kids. Thank you for our kids that are grown. Father, we thank you for it all. And we pray you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.